This episode contains distressing themes and descriptions of sexual violence. This podcast is intended for a mature audience. Listener caution is advised. A Walk Among Us is part of the Acast Creator Network. During the 1970s, forensic DNA analysis had yet to be invented. In the absence of this technique, detectives investigating murders were left with no other choice than to rely on traditional methods, diligently conducting interviews and pursuing leads. At crime scenes, seasoned officers knew the importance of collecting samples including semen, saliva, and hair fibers. The development of DNA fingerprinting in 1986 marked a turning point in forensic science. This groundbreaking technique provided a new level of precision and accuracy in identifying individuals. By 1987, the United Kingdom celebrated its first conviction based on DNA evidence, signalling a seismic shift in the criminal justice system. As time progressed, DNA testing methods evolved, becoming increasingly sophisticated and refined. Cold cases that had remained unsolved for decades were revisited periodically, with renewed hope that advanced forensic analysis could crack the case. With the turn of the millennium, further advancements in DNA extraction techniques emerged, enhancing the ability to obtain valuable genetic material from even the most challenging samples. In 2007, a massive breakthrough was made in two unsolved cases from the 1970s, which showed that an unidentified serial killer was responsible. Welcome to Season 8, Episode 3 of They Walk Among Us, a podcast dedicated to UK true crime. Eve Stratford was born to parents Albert and Liza in the city of Dortmund, Germany on December 28, 1953. Eve's mother was German, and Liza had met Albert following the conclusion of the Second World War, while he was serving as an army medic. The Stratfords led a transient existence during Eve's childhood, moving frequently due to her father's career, before finally settling in the Hampshire town of Aldershot in 1971. Even from a young age... Eve's exceptional intelligence shone through, and she left school with three A-levels. According to her family, she was always laughing and smiling. Her aunt Shirley Jones recalled, Eve was unbelievably herself, and she was always the belle of the ball. Eve harboured dreams of one day becoming an air hostess, but supported herself by working as a secretary in public relations and then at a boutique in London before finding a job at the German tourist office in Mayfair, a position she held for 14 months. Eve's looks often caught the attention of others and they redirected the course of her life. In 1972, she found herself sharing a flat with her boyfriend, 26-year-old Tony Priest, in a property converted into apartments on Lyndhurst Drive in Leytonstone, London. He was the lead singer of the Cornish psychedelic rock band Vineyard. The group had previously been called Onyx and had some success with being the support band for Queen and other popular groups of the time. The following year, Eve, then 19, began working at the Park Lane Playboy Club, which was housed in a 10-storey building designed by renowned architects Richard Llewellyn Davis, Geoffrey Weeks, 
and Walter Gropius. Eve worked the lunchtime shift. The venue was the first Playboy Club in Britain. It had opened in 1966, drawing in large crowds of the rich and famous, even hosting Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate's wedding reception in 1968. In the club, Playboy bunnies wore blue velvet and silver trim costumes. They served drinks using the bunny dip, which involved a back bend similar to a limbo, allowing them to transport drinks from their trays to the tables without exposing themselves. Jill Ball, a former Playboy bunny, said of the club, Everybody wanted to be a bunny. It was just the thing back then. It was a dream come true, and you met all the rich and famous people. Colleagues described Eve as very gentle and a warm and friendly person. She trained as a cocktail bunny, and within two weeks she was earning £1.50 per hour and bringing in tips as well. With her platinum blonde hair and piercing blue eyes, Eve effortlessly captivated the club's patrons and playboy executives. Recognising Eve's potential, Playboy frequently utilised her looks in club promotions, well aware that her presence alone could draw throngs of eager men. When Playboy boss Hugh Hefner saw pictures of Eve, he sent his photographer to see if she could become the magazine's Playmate of the Month. However, the photographer told the already svelte Eve, you'll have to lose a little weight. January 1975 marked a pivotal moment in Eve's life, as she was granted two months' leave from the Playboy Club while she pursued her modelling and acting career. She had ambitions to become a high-end fashion model and to star in television commercials. In early March, Eve was featured in Mayfair magazine. In the piece, she referred to herself under her stage name, Eva von Bohr. Eve described how she lived, quote, alone with Eric the Cat, an enormous number of records, a bulging wardrobe of clothes, and a jewel box glittering with gold ornaments. She also revealed her romantic interests and was quoted as saying, If a man is truly a man and not effeminate in any way, he'll know how to handle me. I like to be dominated, not whipped and tied up or things like that, just kept in my place. Eve reportedly went on to say, I get very bored with straight sex. I like playing little games with my lovers to turn us both on. The magazine also included a full spread naked photograph of Eve as Mayfair's Girl of the Month and included an extract from the interview which read that she, quote, used to be attracted to other girls, but find that I prefer men now. While Eve had a steady boyfriend, she knew that to garner attention and build her career in the modelling world, she needed to portray herself as available. Even though Eve Stratford was a playboy bunny, those people who knew her at the club said she was much more reserved than how she was portrayed in Mayfair. Some said that her comments about sex had thrown them off guard. According to Eve's father, she denied saying those words and cried when the magazine hit the shelves. Albert stated, She was a good girl. This made her look like a girl of easy virtue, which she definitely was not. Eve's appearance as Mayfair's Miss March was not received well by her Playboy employers who enforced a several-month suspension for posing for a rival brand. Eve knew it was a risk, 
but she was ambitious. Her career was taking off. She had even been featured on the front of a book, and more offers were coming in. She came to realise that a career in fashion modelling might be unlikely given her height at five foot five, so she considered a future in glamour modelling. Things were also changing for Eve's boyfriend. Opportunities for Tony's band began to dry up. He took on work as a forklift truck driver. On the evening of March 18th, 1975, Tony returned to the flat he shared with Eve and two other members of his band. As he entered their bedroom, Tony was confronted by a shocking discovery. His girlfriend Eve lay on the floor. Her throat had been slashed, and there were around a dozen deep wounds across her face. The violence of the attack was so severe that her neck was nearly severed. Most of her clothing had been removed with one foot bound by stockings and her wrists tied together with a scarf. When investigators arrived at the property, they found no signs of forced entry, struggle or robbery. However, a peculiar discovery in the hallway caught their attention. An arrangement of dried flowers resembling the bouquet featured in Eve's article in Mayfair. Detectives considered this find a potentially significant clue. While the crime scene was examined, Eve's body was removed for examination. The pathologist reported that along with her injuries, she had been sexually assaulted before she died. The investigation into Eve Stratford's murder began promptly, and detectives asked Tony and other members of his group who lived in the flat to come down to the police station to provide statements. Tony explained in his interview that in the days before Eve's murder, she had been receiving phone calls where the caller hung up without saying a word. She had also complained to her boyfriend about a strange man hanging around and following her. This prompted detectives to speak with Eve's friends and colleagues at the Playboy Club, hoping to identify any customers who displayed a particular or obsessive interest in her. They also appealed to the public for information asking anyone who might have noticed anything suspicious in the Lindhurst Drive area to come forward. Additionally, they requested that anyone who saw a person or people entering or leaving apartment 61A between 3pm and 5.30pm, the estimated time of the murder, to get in touch with them as soon as possible. Despite an extensive search, the murder weapon remained undiscovered. Detectives urged Eve's neighbours to search their gardens for any potential evidence that could aid the investigation. Maybe the knife had been discarded when the killer fled the scene. One theory the investigators entertained was that Eve's killer had become fixated on her after reading the article in Mayfair. It was speculated they were someone with a fetish for restraining women and may have become violently fixated on Eve. Given the absence of signs of forced entry or a struggle, detectives considered two likely scenarios. First, Eve may have been so terrified that she complied with her killer's demands hoping to survive. He might have come to the door already brandishing the murder weapon. Or the second possibility, the killer could have been someone known to Eve. The significance of the bouquet of flowers found in the hallway lingered in detectives' minds. 
according to Tony and the other roommates. The bouquet was not there earlier in the morning. They were not decorations that were known to be part of the decor. Detectives theorized that the killer may have brought the flowers to the flat and left them behind as a morbid calling card. Several days passed, and on March 21st, a reward of £1,000 was offered for any information that could lead to the arrest of Eve Stratford's killer. The reward was organised by the Playboy Club. While detectives persisted in their search for a suspect, they also retraced Eve's last known movements. They aimed to determine whether she had purchased the flowers herself or if the killer had brought them to the flat, possibly as a ploy to gain entry. On the day of the murder, Eve had visited her agent in Camden and then travelled to Bayswater to see a promotions consultant. At the time, she was still suspended from her job at Playboy, but she was not worried. She was motivated and wanted to make the most of her free time. Her agent said there may be another modelling job on the horizon, again with a rival but much smaller publication than Playboy. From Bayswater, she took a train to Leytonstone tube station and then walked the short distance home. Detectives still needed to figure out how exactly the flowers came to be in the flat, but it was not long before they learned that Eve had in fact purchased the flowers herself while in London. This fact gave rise to another theory. As the flowers were found in the hallway, detectives surmised that Eve was attacked as she entered the home. Shortly after Eve Stratford's murder, Marilyn Looms, who had also posed naked for Mayfair magazine, received a chilling phone call. A man with a rough voice threatened her, saying, I am going to kill you. I know who you are and where you live. Startled, Marilyn hung up the phone and quickly contacted her boyfriend and her mother, while ensuring that her doors were securely locked. Concerned for her safety, she then phoned the police and shared the details of the disturbing call. Marilyn spoke about the effect the incident had on her. Since then, I keep changing my route when I drive home at night in case someone is lying in wait for me. It was not the first threatening call she had received since posing naked in December 1974. She had received dozens of similar calls in the past. On March 23rd, while Marilyn was at home speaking with a reporter from the Sunday Mirror, her telephone rang. A mystery man had called again. This time the tone was different. He mentioned his desire to take Marilyn to Manchester. Detectives began considering the possibility that this might be Eve Stratford's killer, and he had an obsession with Playboy bunnies. News had reached detectives about a sexual assault on a Playboy bunny that had occurred in November before Eve's murder, when Dawn Hibbert was attacked after leaving London's Playboy Club. Dawn had agreed to go on a date. The evening started pleasantly enough when the pair got a drink at a wine bar. However, upon entering the man's flat for a nightcap, the atmosphere changed and Dawn's date became violent. She was threatened with a knife during the assault. Frustratingly, after Dawn reported the incident to the police, she heard nothing more. Like Eve Stratford and Marilyn Looms, Dawn had also posed naked for Mayfair. In addition, two months before Eve's murder, another playboy bunny named Lorna was attacked as she left the club. 
A man approached her and inquired if she was a bunny. When Lorna confirmed she was, he launched an assault. As she fought back, a woman in a nearby car screamed, Kill her, kill her. As detectives delved deeper into Eve Stratford's case, they explored the possibility that she might have been followed home from the Leighton Stone tube station on the day she was killed. To learn of any potential witness sightings, they conducted door-to-door inquiries on the three-quarter mile route from the station to Lindhurst Drive. To refresh the memories of potential witnesses, Constable Elaine Bishop participated in a reconstruction of Eve's last known movements. She dressed similarly to Eve, carrying a modelling portfolio and a bouquet of flowers. Passers-by were asked, Were you here last week? Did you see Eve? The reconstruction yielded results as several individuals reported seeing Eve Stratford walking home. Some witnesses claim to have observed a man following her for at least part of her journey from the station. They mentioned that he had disembarked from the same train as Eve. According to their descriptions, the man was aged between 35 and 40, approximately 5 feet 8 inches tall, well built, and his head was a mass of short, thick, dark hair. He was wearing a light-coloured mac or top coat. Detectives made a public appeal, stating, We would like to speak to the man as we would like to eliminate him from inquiries, and he may have seen something that may help us. Despite having a description of a person of interest, the physical details seemed generic and detectives struggled to uncover any further leads. That said, investigators would learn of a woman in her 60s who was questioning residents near the crime scene about the murder. She seemed particularly interested in whether anyone had witnessed a man outside Eve's flat on the afternoon of the killing. Curiously, the woman carried a photograph of this individual, but refused to show it to anyone. Detectives speculated that she feared her husband or son might be connected to the crime. They appealed for her to come forward, but unfortunately she never did. As time passed, detectives became increasingly determined to uncover something, anything that could lead them to Eve Stratford's killer. In late April, a new strategy was adopted. Officers distributed leaflets to numerous homes on Lindhurst Drive and James Lane. The leaflets described two men of interest. The first was the individual believed to have followed Eve, while the second was spotted near her flat. According to witness accounts, The second man appeared to be in his early thirties or forties, approximately five feet five inches tall, with a rosy complexion and bushy eyebrows. One witness claimed to have seen him walking up Lindhurst Drive from Lee Road around 4pm. The eyewitness noted that the man had a peculiar gait, saying his walk resembled someone who was pregnant. This person wore a dark grey or navy coat that was too long for him. The witness demonstrated the walk to detectives, emphasising that he likely walked slowly with hands in his pockets and had an unusual foot placement. According to another witness, she believed she saw this same man waiting outside Eve's flat but her description of the man's height varied with the first witness's recollection. She thought the man was about three inches taller, 
and she noticed nothing strange about his gait, although this was likely because he was not in motion when she saw him. Additional information came from neighbours in the area. One local reported hearing Eve's door slam at around 3.45pm on the day of her murder. Another neighbour claimed to have heard two sets of footsteps and two voices, one male and one female in Eve's room at 4.30pm. Approximately 15 minutes later, a loud thump was heard as if a chair had fallen, followed by only one set of footsteps. Detectives strongly believed this was the moment when Eve was killed. A third neighbour recalled hearing Eve's phone ring at around 4.30pm, but it went unanswered. Despite several appeals for information, these men were not identified, and the investigation continued. By September, over 500 individuals had been interviewed, resulting in more than 1,000 pages of statements. Detectives had questioned numerous photographers, pop stars, actors and affluent clients from the Playboy Club. It was a popular place to go at the time. They could not provide any insight or a significant lead into Eve Stratford's murder. However, in October, detectives got a fresh lead, several hundred miles away in Liverpool. A man who had been living in a bedsit had left without paying the rent owed. When the landlord entered the room to clean up, he came across newspaper clippings about Eve Stratford's murder. The paper was smeared with what appeared to be lipstick. Eve's Mayfair magazine pictures were also present in the mess, and they had been pierced with a dart. Detective Superintendent John McFazdeen, who was heading the murder investigation, stated, It is possible that he had a kinky macabre interest in the girl following this brutal killing. Detectives were obviously keen to track the man down. They shared their belief he could still be hanging around the Merseyside area. Addressing the fact that a dart had been used to pierce a picture of Eve, Detective Superintendent McFazdeen continued, At this stage, I do not attach anything terribly suspicious to the flit, other than he left, presumably to avoid paying rent. While the investigation into Eve Stratford's murder progressed, another tragic case unfolded 30 miles away. On Wednesday, September 3rd, 1975, 16-year-old Lynn Whedon was out celebrating. She was with friends at a disco being held at the Elm Tree Pub in Hounslow after finishing her O-levels. Lynn already knew in which direction she wanted to take her life. She had aspirations of becoming a travel courier or a bilingual secretary. She planned to enrol in a course at Chiswick Polytechnic to specialise in French and German. The headmaster at Lambton School, Harold Winkle, recalled of Lynn, She was a very good student and an excellent linguist. Outside of her academic pursuits, Lynn was described as fun-loving with a great sense of humour, but she was also shy and reserved. Her parents had wondered whether their daughter should be going out more to enjoy her teenage years. That night, Lynn and her two childhood male friends left Elm Tree Pub at around 11pm, parting ways on Great West Road. Her friends assumed she would be safe, because Lynn's home on Lambton Avenue in Hounslow was so close, 
just on the other side of an alleyway lined with tall, overgrown hedges. However, Lynn had promised her parents she would not use that alleyway, previously referred to as Short Hedges, due to its seedy reputation as several men had exposed themselves there. Lynn Whedon was attacked by someone in the dark alleyway shortly after quarter past eleven. She was struck on the head with a heavy object. It was thought it could have been a crowbar hammer or even an axe. Her traumatised body was forcibly carried into an open-air electricity substation near the grounds of a school. There, severely injured, she was raped and left alone in an awful condition. The following morning around 8am, Lynn's body was discovered by the school caretaker. She was unconscious and partially undressed, with her underwear stuffed into her mouth. The 16-year-old, barely clinging to life, was immediately rushed to West Middlesex Hospital, where it was discovered that she had two skull fractures, facial lacerations, and was suffering from hypothermia. Despite the doctor's best efforts, Lynn Whedon never regained consciousness and passed away six days later. Detective Chief Superintendent David Frew, who led the murder investigation, issued a warning that the perpetrator could strike again. He believed Lynn's killer must have had bloodstains on their clothing and urged women to come forward if their sons or husbands returned home with bloody garments that night. Following Lynn Whedon's murder, women living near the location of the attack started a petition to have the 12-foot-high hedge along the alleyway cut down. One woman expressed her unease, saying, I have never liked walking down that path. I know it's a shortcut from the Great West Road, but even in daylight, I hurry along. The fact that Lynn had been attacked down the alleyway led detectives to believe that her killer was a local man, somebody who knew the area well and knew he most likely wouldn't be disturbed. In an effort to keep Lynn Whedon's murder in the public's consciousness, detectives distributed posters featuring photographs of Lynn and details of the crime. As the investigation wore on, Lynn was late to rest on September 19th. All of her loved ones came together at the Holy Trinity Church in Hounslow, and the service was led by Reverend John Barter, who touched on the societal issue of sex and violence. He stated, Lynn's murder and suffering of her family is part of this terrible price paid for someone else's wickedness. It is right that we should be shocked and horrified because it is only then that we stop and think, and we see that in our society, we have allowed sex and violence to dominate our television, our papers, our cinemas and our stage. Following the church service, Lynn's parents, Fred and Margaret, led the cortege down Hounslow High Street to Mortlake Crematorium. By October, the police had collected nearly 1,000 statements in their pursuit of Lynn Whedon's killer. They expanded their team to over 30 detectives. Eyewitnesses provided valuable information, including one who saw a man in his early 20s running across Great West Road shortly after Lynn was attacked. Another witness reported seeing a young man, possibly the same individual, loitering in the alleyway at around 8pm, three hours prior to the attack.
Mary Haynes, who was walking her dog at the time, encountered the man and felt uneasy. Detectives explored the possibility of a connection between Lynn's murder and other sexual assaults in the area, but this line of investigation did not yield any significant results. Door-to-door -door inquiries were conducted, involving over 400 men with, quote, known sexual propensities, but no breakthroughs emerged from these interviews. Detectives faced the daunting task of meticulously analysing statements repeatedly in search of vital clues. Since there were no apparent links between Eve Stratford's murder and Lynn Whedon's, the investigations were treated as separate cases, with separate perpetrators being sought. The new year came and went as detectives in London persisted in their pursuit of a suspect. In March 1976, the first anniversary of Eve's murder passed without any new developments. Her mother publicly appealed for anyone shielding the person responsible to speak up. Liza stated, If you know who did this to my Eve, he must also know he is sick and needs treatment. He may do it again, and you can't live with that on your conscience. Despite Liza's heartfelt plea, no significant information emerged. However, coincidentally, on September 21st, some newspapers reported on another series of attacks. In large font, one headline read, Bonnie and Clyde Sex Attackers Hunted. The article detailed a sexually motivated assault in Gillingham, Kent. A female in a white car lured an 18-year-old to the vehicle while the teenager was waiting at a bus stop. The male occupant of the car then attacked the girl at a second location after she was dragged inside the vehicle. A further incident played out in the same way with minor differences 12 miles away in Sittingbourne. The couple were thought to be young, in their late teens to early twenties. They were mentioned in the same breath as Lynn Whedon, perhaps due to her age. It is unusual but not unheard of for couples to carry out this sort of crime together. Perhaps the earlier assault on the Playboy Bunny with a female screeching from a car, kill her, kill her, suggested the cases could be linked. Was it the same perpetrators? On Thursday, September 9th, 1977, 27-year-old Elizabeth Paravicini left her parents' home on the Grove in Isleworth, Hounslow, to meet some friends. In an odd connection to Lynn Whedon, Elizabeth was the daughter of local architect George Graham, who designed the Holy Trinity Church in Hounslow, where Lynn's funeral had taken place. Elizabeth was married to an Italian accountant named Rick, and the couple had two young daughters. With aspirations of becoming an actress, she made many connections in the theatrical world. Although she lived in Rome with her husband and children, Elizabeth had returned to the United Kingdom to visit her parents and sister. That evening, along with her friend, she attended the 8.30 showing of Fellini's Casanova in Leicester Square. Afterwards, they had a couple of drinks before Elizabeth boarded the last train from Hammersmith to Hatton Cross, which arrived at Osterley Station. From there, Elizabeth walked along Great West Road, the same route that Lynn Whedon had taken two years earlier. Elizabeth then turned right onto Osterley Road, heading towards her parents' home. 
However, as she made the journey, she was suddenly attacked from behind. An assailant struck Elizabeth on the head with a heavy object and dragged her around ten yards into nearby bushes. That night, Elizabeth's parents had expected her to return home late, so they went to bed. Unsettled, her father George woke up during the night and realised she hadn't returned. He contacted one of Elizabeth's friends who confirmed that she did turn up as planned. They had spent time with her and then they parted ways. Concerned, George called the police at 3.30am to report his daughter missing. As dawn broke, George and his other daughter, Gillian, embarked on a search for Elizabeth, retracing the route she would have taken to walk home along Osterley Road. At approximately 5am, 150 yards from their home, they discovered something very unsettling. On the pavement were Elizabeth's shoes and handbag. Then, just yards away, they came across Elizabeth. She was face down in the bushes. She wasn't moving, and there were no signs of life. As Elizabeth's body was transported from the scene for examination, officers arrived to gather evidence. The post-mortem revealed that she had died from blunt force trauma, but there was no evidence of sexual assault. That said, detectives believe that the primary motive was sexual, speculating that Elizabeth's killer had been unable to remove her tight jeans or had been interrupted by a passerby. Elizabeth's husband, who was in Italy at the time of the murder, travelled to England to comfort his daughters who were staying with their grandparents. Investigators focused on determining if anyone had witnessed Elizabeth on her walk home or if anyone had observed her being followed. On September 10th, detectives made a plea over the public address system at Brentford Football Ground appealing to thousands of fans who might have seen Elizabeth in the moments leading up to the attack. The investigation into Elizabeth Paravicini's murder continued, but detectives also made the decision to re-examine the details of Lynn Whedon's murder. There were striking similarities between the two cases, and it was nearly the second anniversary of Lynn's death, prompting detectives to question if the attack was some form of anniversary killing. Simultaneously investigating both murders, detectives intensified their efforts by questioning known sex offenders and conducting extensive door-to-door inquiries. They firmly believed that Lynn and Elizabeth were both victims of the same killer, someone intimately familiar with the Hounslow area. Detective Superintendent Chris Draycott announced, This man is definitely local, and I'm sure someone knows who he is and is shielding him. My message to that person is please contact me immediately. There is no way of knowing if he will kill again. Several witnesses reported seeing two men outside the train station when Elizabeth left, with one leaning against a wall at the entrance and the other positioned at the mouth of a nearby subway. As Elizabeth walked along the road, a third man appeared and began closely following her towards her home. Detective Superintendent Draycott urged these men to come forward to eliminate them from the inquiry. A composite sketch of the man seen following Elizabeth was released, and he was described as stocky, dark-haired, 25 to 35 years old, standing between 5 feet 6 inches and 5 feet 8 inches tall, with a broken nose. 
despite extensive efforts including a reconstruction of Elizabeth's route by a female police officer. The man who followed her was never identified. Thousands of interviews were conducted, and numerous statements were taken, but the case gradually grew cold, leaving the community filled with fear as the possibility of a serial killer loomed. Another tragic aspect of the attacks came when police appealed to women to come forward and tell them if they had been the victim of a violent sex attack. Over 200 women spoke up, all with harrowing stories, some even describing how they very nearly lost their lives. In May 1983, PC Paul Thomas, an ex-scoutmaster and respected police officer living in Isleworth, was convicted of a sex attack and terrorising young girls. He received a prison sentence of five and a half years. Thomas had been leading a double life, using the cover of darkness to terrify women and young girls while wearing dark clothes. He would steal their clothing and then subject them to anonymous phone calls causing immense fear. Some reports in the press emerged suggesting that detectives wanted to interview Thomas regarding the unsolved murders of Lynn Whedon and Elizabeth Paravicini. However, the following day a spokesperson from Scotland Yard denied that there was any intention to interview him in connection with the murders. As time passed, the months became years, and the years became decades. The families of Eve Stratford, Lynn Whedon, and Elizabeth Paravicini had to rebuild their lives and move forward as best they could. In 2004, the murder investigation of Eve Stratford was re-examined by a cold case unit, which capitalised on significant advancements in DNA technology. Work was carried out over the next few years, and by 2007, DNA analysis of evidence from the crime scene revealed a small DNA profile of an unidentified man. When this profile was cross-checked against the National DNA Database, it came back as a match to DNA found at another crime scene, Lynn Whedon's. This meant that the same person had killed both Eve Stratford and Lynn Whedon. This development was shocking because detectives had not previously connected these two murders due to the differences in the modus operandi and victim profiles. Detectives announced the reopening of both cases and believed the same killer was responsible for other murders, including that of Elizabeth Paravicini. However, no DNA had been collected in Elizabeth's case. Detectives also considered the possibility that the same person had committed the murder of Patsy Morris in 1980, less than two and a half miles away from the site of Lynn Whedon's murder. It would be discovered in 2008 Patsy had been the former childhood girlfriend of serial killer Levi Belfield. Shortly after her murder, her father received a death threat from a teenage boy and upon learning about Belfield's connection, he believed the call came from him. However, without DNA evidence from the crime scene, investigators couldn't definitively determine the identity of the perpetrator. Another murder that detectives considered potentially linked to the same perpetrator was Linda Farrah. Linda lived five miles away from Eve Stratford's home. On January 19th, 1979, an intruder entered the property where Linda lived 
and fatally slashed her throat. Similar to Weave, Linda had worked at night spots in the West End, and there were notable similarities between the two killings. However, DNA analysis would reveal that the murders were not committed by the same individual, and Linda's case remains unsolved. With the new evidence, the investigations into the murders of Eve Stratford and Lynn Whedon were consolidated under the leadership of Detective Chief Inspector Andy Mortimer. He emphasised the belief that someone out there had kept a dark secret for over 30 years and considered that they might have shared it with a partner or associate who harboured suspicions. The initial step for investigators was to compare the DNA profile of every person of interest in either case. However, none yielded a match. To broadcast the breakthrough more widely, the murders of Eve Stratford and Lynn Whedon were featured on an episode of Crime Watch. Following the broadcast, witness Bernard Andrews came forward with a crucial piece of information. He recounted that on the night Lynn was killed, around 1am, he was driving home to Raysbury from London along Great West Road. At the Sutton Lane Junction with Great West Road in Hounslow, a hitchhiker flagged him down. The man inquired about his destination, mentioning he was heading to the West Country, but he appeared highly agitated. Bernard instinctively felt he needed to distance himself from the man, so he swiftly drove off, leaving the individual behind. Bernard had been interviewed in 1975, presuming the murder had been solved. When he saw it featured on Crime Watch, he was astounded. Bernard described the hitchhiker as approximately 26 years old with somewhat long hair, wearing a brown jacket and carrying a black executive briefcase. A photo fit of the individual was created and released to the public. Concurrently, a cold case team of detectives was established to investigate potential links with other unsolved cases. Operation Stealth was formed, allocated with £100,000 in funding from the Home Office to explore various unsolved murders across the United Kingdom, including those of Eve Stratford, Lynn Whedon and Elizabeth Paravicini. The team examined the forensic evidence in all the cases, but found no matches beyond Eve and Lynn's murders. Despite the dedicated efforts and resources, the cases remained unsolved. So where are we now? In commemoration of the 40th anniversary of Eve Stratford and Lynn Whedon's murders, in 2015, detectives launched a renewed appeal for information. To incentivize potential witnesses, a reward of £40,000 was offered for any valuable information leading to the apprehension of the killer. Detectives expressed their hope that the passage of time would encourage someone with knowledge of the case to come forward. As if speaking to someone who had information about who was responsible, Detective Chief Inspector Noel McHugh of the Metropolitan Police stated... I urge you to examine your conscience, and if you are wavering on making that call, think of Eve's family who have now passed away, and Lynn's parents who are in their eighties and have endured forty dreadful years not knowing who murdered their daughter. That same year, investigators made a small breakthrough. They confirmed that the killer was of North European origin. However, despite this advancement, no further information could be obtained from the forensic evidence. 
Detectives strongly believe that the same person responsible for Evan Lynn's murders also killed Elizabeth Paravicini. If still alive today, the perpetrator would be well into his 70s or 80s. Speculation among some detectives working the case suggests that he may have moved abroad or even passed away. Others hold the belief that he remains free, living in a constant state of apprehension that one day the police will come knocking on his door. In 2020, Detective Chief Inspector McHugh reiterated his conviction that someone somewhere holds the key to cracking the case. He stressed that it is inconceivable for the killer of Eve Stratford, Lynn Whedon and Elizabeth Paravicini, whether that be the same killer or not, to have maintained their secret for four decades. The weight of such knowledge would likely lead to details slipping out over the years, possibly shared with a partner, friend or even a cellmate. He made a heartfelt appeal to anyone with information to come forward and assist in bringing closure to the long-standing mystery. DCI McHugh told Crime Watch, What we do know is that the killer had a link to the Leytonstone area in March 1975 and the Hounslow area in September, and in particular to the Hounslow area. He would have been familiar with the alleyway called Short Hedges. He would have been a white male aged between 17 and 30 at the time of the murders. The possibilities of who killed Eve, Lynn and Elizabeth are almost endless. Of course, some are looking in the direction of Yorkshire Ripper Peter Sutcliffe, who was convicted of bludgeoning women to death from 1975 to 1980. It is thought that Sutcliffe had attacked many more women in and around this time. However, just as with the cases of Eve Stratford, Lynn Whedon and Elizabeth Paravicini, no definitive proof has emerged that he claimed further victims. Thank you for listening, and special thanks to our patrons for their support. For more information on this episode, please see the show notes or visit our website, theywalkamonguspodcast.com.